Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 169 of the Mom Hour. I am Megan Francis here, as always, with Sarah Powers, and I'm excited about this episode, aren't you? I'm really excited about it. So we just talked about kind of a behind the scenes in our Sunday episode, um, More Than Mom. We talked about like the behind the scenes of what's going on with the Mom Hour and Life Listened, and I think it dovetails really nicely because today we're offering some time management tips and productivity tips. So. We told you what we're doing, and now we're going to tell you kind of, I guess, how we do it. How we do it. And even going back (laughs) to last Tuesday, we talked about seasonal slumps. So you can think of this as like almost the antidote to that one, because we kind of complained about August being this, not sure where we are. Are we still in summer? Are we ready for back to school? What's happening? What day is it? So this is great timing for like a back on track. And I want to say, too, that I think all of these tips apply to stay at fully stay at home part-time stay at home, full-time working outside the home, like really whatever your situation, we're just talking about kind of high-level productivity and time management hacks, like little ways to trick yourself into getting the things done because we know you have things to do, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And I I also want to point out that the roadmap we're sort of using for this episode is a series of blog posts I wrote in 2010. Oh my gosh. So my life was completely different than I had a baby and a three-year-old and a five year old five and a half year old and you know like all of my kids were little Uh, and (laughs) that's where a lot of our listeners are now actually yeah yeah when you were looking back at these you were like my life is so different now and my first thought was but our listeners lives are very much like this yeah yeah and some of the references are also like dated which I think is kind of fun too so I I think we can riff on that a little bit it'll be fun Um, I also want to let everybody know that Katie's back with me at the end of this episode and um, she comes on once a month but we actually batch record so I have not seen Katie and recorded with her in quite a while I'm excited we're actually recording that segment um, tomorrow and so you guys will hear at the end just stay on like you always do and Katie brings us a struggle a success and a discovery from her life as a mom of two little ones. They're three and almost two right now. So again, that's right where a lot of you guys are in motherhood. All right, before we get going, let's talk about our sponsor, Hydrolite. So it has been hot and sweaty here, Megan. Listeners have heard me talk about my air conditioning being out, but it is back. Regardless, hydration is super important in the summer. And then especially if you are doing camping, hiking, sports, or if somebody gets sick, then it's really easy to get dehydrated. And dehydrated kids in particular are no joke. It's something to keep an eye on. So Hydrolyte is a great tasting clinical hydration product that contains all the right balance of sodium, glucose, and water to rapidly replace those fluids and electrolytes that we lose when we're dehydrated. But it, what it doesn't have is all that extra sugar that you're going to find in your typical sports drinks. So Hydrolyte delivers up to four times the electrolytes with 75% less sugar. I like those numbers. Their solutions are appropriate for all ages, Um, so little kids can have them, and you can mix it and dose it with really easy-to-follow instructions on the packaging, so it works for the whole family. It's available in a pre-mixed drink, a powder, or these fun little effervescent tablets that you just drop into your water bottle or glass of water, and poof, hydration. So Hydrolyte is available in the digestive... (laughs) Poof! Poof, Here we go. We're (laughs) hydrated. Um, It's available in the digestive aisle at Rite Aid or online at Amazon.com. And we have a promo code where you can save 30%. That's actually really big savings on their Amazon store. So you visit hydrolite.com slash podcasts and use the code HydraKid, and that will save you 30% on their Amazon store. Again, it's hydrolite.com slash podcasts. Okay, Sarah, well, usually you drive the bus on these Tuesday episodes, but I'm going to take over. I'm getting in the driver's seat, putting on the hat Um, because this is a blog, like kind of based on a blog post I wrote. So I thought it'd be fun for me to kind of guide us through this, these tips. Yeah. And I also Um, think you, you really did a lot of writing and thinking about this in those days when you were, you were running, I mean, you were freelancing from home with five children in various levels of school and stuff. So I feel like you just, yeah, you're the authority here. I'll follow along. Well, I wouldn't say that, but (laughs) here we go. Okay, so my first tip um, is to uh, pay close attention to what makes you tick and what doesn't. And what I meant by that was that it took me like, I think 
well into parenting my second child to realize that what I always thought about myself, that I was very um, freewheeling, type B, like laid back, um, had turned into just chaos and inertia Mm -hmm. and really didn't serve me very well. I really needed a lot more structure than I thought I did. Um, But to me, it almost like I have to psych myself into it Mm because it can't be like the kind of structure that feels um, too like restraining or restrictive Mm -hmm. or like predictable. So there has to be like, there has to be certain things I peg my day to, um, that become sort of what everything else. So making dinner or, you know, my morning workout, like whatever those things are have to be pretty predictable and they have to be a routine. Otherwise, like everything else just falls apart. And I think that I, it just took me a while to figure that out. I really thought I was more like, you know, like just freewheeling. Right. Like structure would hold was. you down, but it turned right. out you actually needed it. I think, yep. I mean, so much of learning how to be productive as an adult or efficient or whatever we want to call it is self-knowledge. That's why there's a yeah. million trillion books about it, but no, <laughs> yep. no one book or system is going to work unless you know yourself and what works for you. I just wanted to add to this that I did read Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies book, I want to say like a year ago. It's been out for quite a bit longer than that. So if you're not familiar, um, The Four Tendencies is a cool framework for thinking about how we each respond to expectations because everyone has expectations in their life and their job. And there are outer expectations, which is like, you know, you have to show up for jury duty or you know, there's a dentist appointment on the calendar or whatever. And then there's inner expectations, which is like we each, you know, we have goals and things we want to get done, but there's no, no, nothing on the outside expecting it from us. And so I am an upholder. And Megan, I think you are probably a rebel who leans toward an obliger, but the four yep, are upholder, so obliger, rebel, and questioner. And the cool thing about it is that there's not, it's not like one is better than any of the other four. You can actually be really productive and creative and, you know, all of those things as any one of the four, but it's really interesting to think about how you set your life and your work up to support what your tendency is. So just like any kind of personality test or anything, it's not like the be all and end all. I do think, especially when we're talking about time management and productivity, it's a really interesting thing to think about. So I'll link that up in the show notes. And it's just called The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. I love that because I think that the most effective, you know, personality tests or whatever are the ones that dig into why you do things because Mm -hmm. until you know why you do things, I feel like you can't change them. Um, You can create workarounds, right? And kind of trick yourself a little bit, but you really can't dig into what's happening until you know why you're doing it. So yeah. And this is, uh, this one in particular is pretty narrow. It's really, it's not your entire personality. It's specifically how you, uh, what your relationship is to expectations. And so I think that there's so much similarities there in what we're talking about. So I wanted to mention that. Yep. That's awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to move on to the next tip. So the next tip is always leave a room better than you found it. That was like something my mom always Mm -hmm. really drilled into my head when I was a kid. And and for me, it's become so second nature. I don't even think about it now. It's why my kids get mad at me for throwing stuff away that they're working on because yeah. I don't even know I've done it <laughs> because I'm always like, I walk through a room, I pick something up on my way through yeah. and take care of it. You know, it's just, it's just um, habit. And what I have found is that if I'm always making things a little bit better when I leave them, mm-hmm. then I don't have to go back later and start from scratch mm-hmm. and try to clean the whole thing up from, you know, and like a big, a big mess becomes smaller and smaller if you pick away at it during the day or it doesn't have a chance to really take hold. I totally agree. And I have to say, I struggle with this one. This is, it might just be my personality, but I, um, I have this thing where if I, if we're talking about clutter, cause I think that's kind of the easiest thing. Yeah. We're talking about I have this thing where, okay, on my kitchen counter right now, there's a magna doodle board, like a big magna doodle board. And I know where it goes. It goes in the game closet in this drawer. And I look at it and I think I should really just organize that game closet or I should see if maybe maybe I don't need this magna doodle board. Maybe it should go in the goodwill. And I like instead of just picking it up and putting it where it goes, um, I, in my mind, like make a bigger project out of it and then do nothing. Uh, And I'm sure I'm not alone. There's other weirdos out there like me. So you can tell me who you are. (laughs) But I think because I like 
order and lean toward perfection, I let that get in the way of, like you said, just leaving a room better than you found it. So I have a little mantra that is similar that I literally just made up myself when I was feeling so frustrated by this tendency. And it is pick it up and put it where it goes. That's the only two things. Just pick it up and put it where it goes. And when I'm feeling like my house is really cluttered, that's the only that's the only two options I give myself. It's not like maybe I should rethink where the magna doodle lives or maybe I should have the kids do it oh shoot I'm not having the kids pick up their own stuff like I'll do that too so just pick it up and put it where it goes because like you said then little by little by little the load is lightened and the the room is less cluttered and you don't you can need to be a whole thing (laughs) you can always go and take care of that project another time it's not like putting it away isn't taking that off the table exactly exactly so yeah that's my that's my version of leaving a room better than you found it is pick it up put it where it goes the end nothing else The end. Nothing else. I like it. Okay, so moving on. Um, The next tip I had was to create good habits. So I think we sometimes think of habits as like not always the most positive things. Mm -hmm. But when they're the right things, um, they're actually very helpful. And I would also add to that now that I'm eight years wiser than I was then. you have to have an association sometimes to like create the habit. So the habit doesn't just happen by itself. It's you do something over and over and over again, and then it becomes a habit. And sometimes you really need to like almost, um, almost like trick yourself into it. And I'll give an example. We were just the other day talking about um, how podcasting got started for us. And mm-hmm. I was saying that the reason I started listening to podcasts was I wanted to be in the dinner. Uh, I wanted to be in the dinner making space more. Yeah. And Every night I wanted to be in the kitchen. And so I decided to kind of force myself into the kitchen to stop my work, to stop what other things I was doing around the house and to make that transition. Um, And the way I did it was by listening to podcasts. And so that started sort of this whole crazy journey. But without that like association to help me make uh, that time in the kitchen a thing, Mm -hmm. I think I would have just continued to kind of like do that thing where you put it off so long that you almost can't even start dinner because it's too late. And by the time you get everything out and start chopping up the vegetables, it'll be like seven o'clock at night. So yeah. So I don't know. Does that, does that sort of ring true for you? Yes, definitely. And I, I wanted to add that sometimes the practice of creating good habits can include, we're talking about productivity and time management, but if you are a like achievement oriented person or like a naturally really productive person, I would add that creating good habits can also mean purposely blocking off time for leisure or pleasure activities. Yes. I know for me, I've been in this mode in the last couple of years in particular of working slash producing, you know, being productive in every stolen moment because of my reality of kids at home versus kids at school and what I'm trying to get done. And so what I've noticed is as my time opens up more, I am I am conditioned to grab every 15 minute block that I have and get something yeah. done. And number one, that's not really healthy or fun in the long run. But number two, I think we all know, and science will tell you that the most productive people are the people who are not productive all the time. Like you have right. to have rest and recharge and take breaks and it won't happen if they're not scheduled. And I want to talk to our like new mom, stay at home mom, maternity leave moms here, because I think it's very similar when you have a brand new baby or a couple of babies and you you go into that mode where like if someone's asleep, you immediately yes. start doing all of the things. <laughs> yeah. And and I think it's a personality thing. I think some people are better at like resting when it's time to rest and some people have a harder time of that. But really start to think about like prioritizing non-productivity in the same way you prioritize productivity, because all of this is time management. And I would argue that time management includes making sure there is time built in to not be productive, if that makes sense. And that's and literally and not just talking about work at home moms. Yeah. But also, like if you're in that phase where like you only get to put the baby down for like 15 minutes a day, you know what I'm talking about. It's that yeah. it's that frenetic. Got to get all the things done. And literally nobody can be productive all the time. It's not possible. <laughs> so I think we just hurt ourselves when we yes. try so hard to be doing, doing, doing and yep. getting things done um, actually gets in the way of getting those very same things done. Totally. In a, in a strange way. Okay. Um, okay. So the next tip was to write it down. And so this has been one of the things that is completely proven itself to be essential for me. If I do not get things out of my head and either, well, I prefer to literally write them with a pen mm-hmm. in a notebook, but if I don't at least get them out of my head and put them in some other place, everything just starts fighting for space in my brain. And it turns into this, I used to describe it as like this, um, 
almost like I could see the thoughts like hovering above my head. They were just creating this like <laughs> whirlwind or, you know, like a tornado, but I couldn't grab any of them. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't reach up in this little cloud above my head and grab that thought and hold on to it because it was so mixed up with so many other ones. Mm-hmm. So, um, I am constantly writing. I am a journaler. Um, I've been journaling a lot lately and sometimes it's just rambling, but like often it's kind of a weird mix of, uh, emotional stuff and productive stuff Mm -hmm. that come out in the same Mm -hmm. block of text. Um, But also I find that before bed, making a to-do list for the next day is really, really helpful because then you don't have to wake up in the morning and be like, wait, what was I thinking about last night? Like Mm -hmm. just like the, the harder. And even if you're a great person, a morning person after eight hours of sleep, it's going to be some work to kind of get back Mm -hmm. into the groove of whatever it was you were into last night. So the easier you can set yourself up, you know, the easier you make it, on your morning self by setting yourself up um, at night, I think the better. And I know that you get really tired and grumpy, Sarah. Last yeah, thing I would night, never, so. ever make a to-do <laughs> list at night. It was like the last thing I would ever do. So how do you do it? Um, well, I would do it in the morning, but I'm also a pen and paper notebook. And um, I have to say, if you guys like to geek out about this, like to-do list specifically, oh, we have a whole episode for you. <laughs> um, it's 83, episode 83 from January of 2017. And it's about our to-do lists and our calendars, which again, there's a lot of overlap here. But um, I also am pen and paper. And I, I was just going to add that I have to look at my pen and paper to-do list before I open up my computer. There's a lot of gifts that, that digital... <laughs> technology has given us. And there are great apps and stuff for managing your productivity online or on your computer. But I, once I'm looking at my computer, my brain is like a different brain. It's, yes. It's I'm computer sure, brain. I'm sure I could create some habits around that as well. And I have played around with some and, you know, you and I have our ways of, of being productive online or digitally together. So it's not like I'm going to throw away the computer, but I have to look at my to-do list before. The other thing I was going to add is my to-do list, I think, is different than yours in that mine is longer and more running. And so I, I've seen when you write stuff down, you keep it pretty, you're really good at prioritizing. And that is a hard, it's harder for me. I would rather list all the things I need to do and like delude myself that I'm going to get to all of them. <laughs> so a trick that I use for myself is before I open my computer, I will make a side list either on the side of my notebook page or like on a post-it notes of like, I have to do these three things. I'm going to open my computer and I have to do these three things. And again, for the not for the moms who aren't working right now, um, it could be like RSVP to that birthday party, order diapers on Amazon. Like, you know what I'm talking about? You open the computer yeah. and then your brain goes to mush. So I'm just, I guess I'm echoing what you were saying, but also um, sometimes it helps for me to pare down to one or two or three things before I even, you know, sit down or whatever. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Well, and you can have lists of things like, and I have, and I, I'm glad that you're mentioning that other episode about to-do lists because this could be, I mean, it can yeah. be its own episode. Oh, it was. Um, <laughs> and we really got into the weeds on it, but I have this crazy sort of, it would be impossible for me to articulate the notebook system that I have because it's always changing and it really doesn't make any sense. But to me, it makes sense. So my like to-do list is very different. So the, the to-do list you might see that I make that it's a prioritized, short, yeah, actionable list is like whittled from four notebooks that I have going on right now. One being my journal, which is just like stream of consciousness, whatever's on my brain. A lot of stuff comes out in there Mm -hmm. and then I pluck from it. I have these sort of like um, goal lists that I make in a different notebook. Mm -hmm. I have sort of like what I'm focusing on this week. That might be like in a schedule that's in a different notebook. And then my to-do list is like just the top things that I have to get done. Um, Now, I used to have post-it notes stuck on my computer Mm -hmm. that would be things I could do while on my computer. And I I thought of that when you said RSVP or buy diapers on Amazon. Mm -hmm. If you have a really hard time not turning your brain, like going into that spiral when you get Mm -hmm. on your computer, at the very least, if you have some productive things you can Mm -hmm. do while on your computer, it Mm -hmm. can get you in that more productive yeah, frame of mind definitely. instead of Facebook frame of mind, which yeah. is not a, typically a very productive and one. And don't you find too, when you're on the computer, you you have different headspace for different things. I mean, you and I both do a lot of writing and creative yeah. work. And so there's certain times where you got to do that. But then there's other times where it feels really good to knock off a bunch of like just administrative life, yes. like adulting yeah. things, like yep. ordering the diapers, RSVPing to the birthday party, signing up for the soccer. Like that is really satisfying in a different way. And you can go through it pretty quickly. So actually, I, I'm we're not going to get into the full to-do list. But in that episode, I talked about, I, I almost have columns in my to-do list for like different categories of things yeah. like that. And that can be helpful too. So again, that was yeah. episode 83. Um, it's not even the one I chose for our cue it up segment. But if you just want to keep going down this rabbit hole, 
we I think we shared pictures of our notebooks in the in the yes, show notes and our calendars and yeah it's fun because we're very different but it's fun to yeah. talk about yeah and I'm always I will also say that I'm always updating the way I do things to to um like <laughs> for example sorry oh I mean I'm gonna cut that yeah. I was like I just smacked my mic yeah. <laughs> really hard when I was coughing <clears throat> all right sorry no, it's okay. um I think also these things can evolve depending on where you are in like what your life is set up like. So when I was working outside the home, I used a to-do list very differently because certain things were just going to get done because I wasn't, well, first of all, certain things didn't have to get done because I wasn't physically inside my house all day. Mm -hmm. And certain things, I had things that had to be done then that I don't have to worry about now. And just the, like the flow of my life was so different. And now that I'm at home again, um, and working from home, I, I'm realizing I need to kind of pull back in some of those old tips that I had sort of let go yeah. of and ways of structuring my day because it's very easy to let a day just kind of get away from you. So yeah, I think just give yourself permission to change things up as your life changes. Yes. Um, and and when to it, keep playing. Yeah. And when in doubt, write it down. I think that's the takeaway. I was just, yeah. <laughs> just to add really quickly, one more thought is your your situation has changed, but so has mine more gradually. And what I realized is I didn't ever used to write down home, home updates and cleaning yeah. and chores because it they just, just got done. I was just right. puttering around my house. And now that I, like we talked about, I've been working in those stolen moments for long enough now that I, especially upstairs, I go upstairs and I'm like, God, where is the maid? Like, what is yeah. like, where I'm like, Oh, right. I, this is also something that we, that I need to prioritize and take care of. And it used to just happen as the week went along and it doesn't anymore. So now I need to, to yeah. do list for that. You know, I, yeah. I need a cleaning and chores to do list for myself. Well, and to go back to like the habits thing and everything else. And the episode we did last week about seasonal slumps and how yeah. we both shared that we have kind of fallen out of the, the nurturing our homes feeling like yes. we're still doing the stuff that has to get done, but like things like going and picking out new throw pillows or yes. something. It's just something I just used to do because my life was set up in such a way that I was in the store where I would want to do that. Yeah. Like Target. And you were spending a lot of time in your home. Yeah. And I was spending a lot of time in my home and those things just happened. And when you fall out of that habit and that those things aren't happening just out of joy yeah. anymore or because you like it and they have to be more deliberately and intentionally planned. Those things I think are really hard to get back into a schedule um, or into your routine because you're focused on other crap right yep. now, right? It's it's not bad. It's not like you need to be shopping for home goods all right. the time. Right. But if you start to feel that lack, yep. it's time to kind of somehow associate it to something else, peg it to another activity yep. you're doing, get it on your list and make it happen again. Yeah. And use all of these tips because it's easy to be productive with the things we're fired up about and have energy for. Right. It's hard we, that when we need these tips is when we're either in a slump or strapped for time or whatever. Yep. So yeah, totally agree. Okay. So let's take a little break while I talk about Green Chef. Green Chef is a USDA certified organic company that sends you everything you need to easily cook delicious meals you can feel good about. So you guys have heard me talk about HelloFresh and Green Chef is actually owned by the same company. So the process is the same. Pre-prepped meals just kind of magically show up on your door with all the ingredients and easy directions you need to quickly put the meals together. Now, Green Chef is a little different in that they offer a wide variety of organic ingredients and also offer plans for people with special diets. And those meal plans include paleo, vegan, vegetarian, keto, gluten-free, omnivore, and carnivore. So you have a lot of choices. You can also switch up those meal plans anytime if you want to try something new. I know you guys have heard me talking about getting in the kitchen more, and I've especially been trying to get used to cooking for myself more when I don't have the kids. Green Chef makes that so easy because they do the meal planning, shopping and prep for me. And then those meals and recipes are just delivered right to my house. And the food is so good. Last night, my sister and I made the Asian chicken and noodle soup. The flavors were restaurant quality. And I love that it's a healthier meal than I would usually make for myself. So it's really cool, you guys. Check it out. Okay, so we're going to give you $50 off your first box. Go to greenchef.us slash the mom hour. Again, that's greenchef.us slash the mom hour. And we're going to give you $50 off your first box. Check it out, guys. Okay, and I am really excited to talk about Canvas people. You guys have heard us talk about them, but I wanted to tell you that I recently pulled together a bunch of old family photos for my grandma's 90th birthday party. I'm talking really old photos, like 50 years. Yeah, or you more. were sending me screenshots of them and they were the best. Yeah, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're beautiful. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have always loved turning my current photos into frames. And we've talked about how great Canvas People is for that. But now I have this little seed of an idea of how cool would it be to get some really old family photos up on the wall in different ways and to give them as gifts. So if oh, that's you're awesome. Yeah. So if you're not familiar, 
Canvas People transforms photos into beautiful, unique, museum-quality canvases that are easy to hang and make really fabulous home decor. I do have one of their canvases already on my mantle right now of a current family picture, and I love it. But I'm really, now my mind, my wheels are turning about using this for those old vintage photos and turning them into wall art and Christmas gifts and all of that. But wait till you hear about this deal, you guys. So Canvas People is going to give you guys an 11 by 14 canvas, which is a $69.99 value for free, for free. You just pay shipping. And how you're going to get that is you're going to text mom hour to 484848. It's a special limited time offer just for today's listeners. And again, you get your own 11 by 14 canvas when you text mom hour, M-O-M-H-O-U-R to 484848. I'm really excited for you guys to check this out. That is a great deal. Uh, two quick notes. They're super easy to lean if you yes. do not like hanging stuff on your walls or are one of those people who never get around to it. Yep. These things lean really, really well. And also, if you have a hard time with numbers, just remember 48, 48, 48. Yeah. I don't know why like 48, 48, 48 is easier for me than 48, 48, 48. I'm actually is loving... Is that weird? No. It's where I'll have our things, <laughs> Megan. I'm loving that this is a text <laughs> offer because I know you guys are yeah. on mobile right now. We know you yes. are. So check that out for sure. And we love Canvas people. All right, Megan, should we get back to All right, to let's get back in. Yep. Um, okay, and this is something I'm struggling with today, so um, <laughs> I just throw it out there. Um, the next tip that we had for productivity and time management is to nurture your energy levels. Um, and by that, when I wrote this post, what I meant was take care of yourself and sleep when you mm-hmm. need to, or veg if yeah. you need to, kind of like you said before. Yeah. Um, but I will also say that another thing that has emerged as I've gotten eight years wiser is nurturing your energy levels isn't just about um, making sure you get enough rest. It's a kind of about understanding how your day plays out yes. and what times of day you're more thinky and what mm-hmm. times of day you're more likely to make it to the gym and actually try, mm-hmm. you know, like there's just certain, we all have peaks and valleys and nobody has the same energy level steadily all day long. It's just not how it works. So just not only nurturing, but knowing your energy levels and your body's natural tendencies can help you make so much better use of your time. Okay, it can, but I'm going to offer the flip side because I think this is a trap I fall into okay. because I, I do know my natural energy levels. In fact, our listeners know my natural energy levels because I'm such an extreme first half of the day, wake up, going. And I always joke that I don't get that second wind. Like I literally just lose energy throughout you the just day run gradually. Out. <laughs> and like my first- Like run- a balloon. Yes. My first running out feels like about, you know, three thirty four, And then I somehow push through and then I'm for realsies out at like 8.30. So what I, what I want to say about this is I've known that about myself for quite a long time, but it does get tricky because sometimes it almost is like I give myself permission to be grumpy and low energy for Uh, the entire second half of the day, which instead what I could do is put a little structure in place. Like you talked about in your very first tip, put a little structure in place or some, some habits or tricks, just like you talked about, because I know that I'm not a great afternoon or evening person. And, Mm. and instead I think, well, it's just how I am. It's just my natural energy, energy patterns. And I'm sort of, uh, leaning on that as a crutch instead of, doing something about it. Does that make sense? And I was, I'm sure yeah, that totally. people who aren't morning people could say the same, you know, I'm just grumpy in the morning. I can't get up. And while that may be true, maybe there is some energy management we can do or some habits we can create so that it's not a miserable way to be. It is your way to yeah. be, but you don't have to be miserable in it. Well, I, I personally have a hard time. Anytime we tell stories about ourselves with too much What's the word I'm looking for here? Like, like with too much decisiveness, like right. this is who I am. Yeah. So that's just how it is. Um, Agreed. And I think that that tends to like being those people who won't speak to anyone until they have coffee, which I've always thought is like really, really ridiculous. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, to me, that feels like one of those overly dramatic things. Like, don't speak to me. It's morning. I'm not a morning person. Well, I'm not a morning person either, but uh, once I'm up, I can talk to you. I just don't right. want to get out of bed. Right. right. So I just think. Whenever we get too vehement about telling these stories about ourselves, yes. it ends up so I can totally see the trap. And I guess maybe when when I'm saying know your energy levels, I'm being 
I'm thinking of it with a more positive spin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, no, I agree. This is a time of day like I'm really on my game and the rest of the day I'm going to take it. E I'm just going to be gentle with myself, yep. not like I am useless. Yep. I notice one thing about myself when I have lower energy is I'm way worse at multitasking. Um, oh, okay. So like in the first half of the day, I could pop on the computer for half an hour. The kids are playing, pop up, do some dishes, pop back to the computer and it doesn't feel it feels fine. And then if I tried to do that same thing at 3.30 or 4 o'clock, I wouldn't be doing anything well. And I would be probably grumpy about it. So um, for me, that's a better time to not work at all and do something more physical like house stuff, dishes, because at least I think being physical and being on my feet is a good antidote yeah. to low energy. What I was going to say, I think I kind of mentioned it right before the ad break, but with all of these tips, when you are in your most naturally productive and creative and getting stuff done, you don't really need any of these tips. Like you're just going to get the things done. But I think it's in these lower energy times or seasons or slumps that these, you know, these habits come really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And I don't know, this is one of those ones too, where I think it can affect everything from like how you eat and when you eat. Yes. I mean, there's just so many things tied up in energy and that's like a whole other yeah. topic too. Um, the way that we fuel ourselves throughout yep. the day and all that. So I just, just pay attention, yeah. I guess, yeah. you know, don't let it get, don't let you, don't paint yourself into a box, yeah. but pay attention. All right. I'm going to move on to the next one. This one is actually making me chuckle. And the only reason I included this is because I need the reminder because yeah. I am falling down on the job. And this is something I was so much better at eight years ago than I am now. Um, and that was ignore your phone. Mm. So let's all go in our time machine <laughs> back to the year 2010. Yep. I had a smartphone, but I did not have a Facebook app. I don't even know if Facebook had an app. Yeah, yet. probably, but I, not in high use. It was early. Early, early I got on. my first, I had a Blackberry before that. I, got, I think I got my first iPhone in 2010. Yeah. I don't know if I had an iPhone, but I definitely had some kind of smartphone. Yeah. And I remember it had like this really kind of crappy screen on it. It was one of those that slide, mm -hmm. like it slides mm -hmm. up and it had like kind of this like, like dumb looking icons on it. And I, I don't, I just didn't do anything on my phone. I really, ha it took me until like two years ago mm -hmm. to become a true phone person. Here's a funny story. Um, the first blog conference I traveled a long distance to, I want to say was in 20, 2008. I think it was in 2008 or 2009. And I had broken my phone or lost it or something and had to take like my child's they had like this little, like a jitterbug kind of phone for a kid. There's a name for it, like a ladybug or something. Okay. It was like one of the original like child phones. Okay. And I had to take it to blog her San Francisco, <laughs> San Francisco, <laughs> like Silicon Valley. <laughs> I am wandering around this huge conference full of mom blogger, um, lady bloggers carrying a child's phone. You're like and the only... lady with five kids from, yes. from the upper Midwest. From the Midwest who knows yeah. nothing, who doesn't know anything. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I've been online for like longer than some of these people even have even known yes. what a blog is, right? And I was like, oh, you know, it just drove me so crazy. <laughs> really but that's because in those days, I really only used my phone for making phone calls. Um, I checked my email and stuff, but mm -hmm. like I didn't obsessively have to. I carried a computer everywhere. I didn't worry. Yeah. Like I just didn't use my phone. So I would do things like, and this used to drive my friends and family crazy. I would have my phone and just like put it down and forget where it was and walk mm -hmm. away from it and not look at it all day long. Um, and then when I'd go and check, like I'd have a million phone calls missed and stuff like that. But like, I still only answer my phone like one in 10 times it, it rings. You never answer your phone. I never answer my phone. That's a lie. There's no one in 10. In fact, the phone, the, um, ringer is set to silent it's not even on vibrate it's silent <laughs> so the only way i'll know if you're calling me is if i'm looking at my phone when you call me or if i'm in the car because it'll come up over the Bluetooth. right and i guess my point <laughs> go ahead no you should get to your point because i think we've yeah. led people along so well, the okay. point so is ignore your phone the point is now productive. i'm on my phone way yeah. too much and it's not productive and i'm i tell myself yeah. i'm productive and i'm not like yes. i tell myself i'm getting more stuff done than I actually am when I'm on my phone. And it's so hard. I just want to acknowledge how hard it is now that my phone is so amazing and it does all these things. Yes. It's so hard not to just default to using it at all times. Okay. Help so me. I might, yeah, I might actually have a couple tips for you because I feel like our trajectory is different. I have yeah. enjoyed smartphones since the beginning and I, because they came of age when I was like strapped under nursing babies 
and I've talked about that on the show, like I got my first iPhone right around the time I had my second baby. Before that, I had a BlackBerry. So I'm just having had kids a little bit later than you and being a little more mobile oriented when I when my kids were babies. I think I I latched on immediately <laughs> to like just the convenience <laughs> of being able to get a few things done on mobile while, you know, doing whatever, like nursing a baby or folding laundry. Actually, you can't fold laundry and actually be on your phone. But you know what I mean? Um so it's no, not. I that, think you can. Yeah, <laughs> I bet you there are people who do it yeah. somehow. I don't know how, but voice, I bet. Yeah, you could <laughs> vox like we vox. Yeah. Um, but I think so. A couple of tips I have, or maybe one, is I save certain phone activities for certain times, and some of them might be more leisure activities, like looking at Instagram, and some of them might be actually more productive, like reply. I will save text messages um, that I know I do need to reply to, and I will do them all at once. So I won't reply when they come in unless it's a true emergency, and I'll do it all at once when my car is parked somewhere and I have five minutes, and then that's all I'll do in that little segment. So I think I'm pretty good at like batch batching phone productivity. I'm not great. Email is hard. Like you and I do a lot of email for work and Mm -hmm. it's easy to get one email come through and then it's like, shoot, your brain is firing, but you didn't, you shouldn't have checked it because you don't really have time. That is the hard. I mean, that's a struggle I think for everybody literally who has an email. Do you, do you, you answer email from your phone? Don't you? I do not. Um, I, if I can help it. So I think I've trended more toward you over the years. I think you've yeah. influenced me. I, I used to have so little time to sit at a computer, Megan, like so yeah. it was so little that, yeah, I used to reply on my phone all the time. And I noticed that, you know, some of our contributor team who are a little younger and have little kids do a lot on their phone, like we'll write out a whole long email on their phone. And I'm sure that was me at one point. But now I have the benefit of being able to sit down at my computer multiple times a day. So I don't do it as much anymore. I will if I need to. Yeah. Um, I always the I always delete the scent from my iPhone. Always. It's like I don't want people to know. Or Yeah, no, I used to. And you know what's funny? I remember being insulted by that when when phones when iPhones first came out. Like if someone sent me an email and it said sent from my iPhone, I remember being irritated. Like I don't remember I don't why know. now. Yeah. And I don't know why I delete it. Except I guess maybe if we're if I'm dealing with clients or someone that maybe doesn't yeah. know that my whole day isn't spent in an office, but I always do it for everybody. I don't know why. I don't know. And I don't know why I had a, such a I had this weird I, to me, it felt like it wasn't as important or something or like yeah. they, they sent this on the fly. And I had this weird I mean, it was brilliant marketing on the part of iPhone, let's just say. Yeah. But like I I felt like the email was less important yeah. because someone sent it from their phone. And that's something that's never really gone away. From well, me. I think that's why um, it's the yeah. same. It's the same reasoning <laughs> of why I delete it from yeah. mine is I don't want that perception. That's funny. Yeah. I will say from a productivity or from a more of a time management standpoint, I have started ignoring my phone for longer periods of time because for the exact same reason, because I now have more work hours, not this summer, not this week, the last week of summer, but in general, I'm not so strapped for time to sit down at the computer and get stuff done or time to have the kids at school and I can get stuff done. So I have started putting my phone away in the evenings. I don't sleep with it by my bed anymore. I usually put it on the charger before Brian and I sit down to watch a show and I was being really good about not looking at it in the early morning, but I threw that that habit went out the window. So you don't use your phone, obviously, as an alarm clock then. I don't. Mm-mm. I should probably stop. I have a very good alarm clock. I really don't need my phone. And it just creates because I have two alarm clocks going off now. Mm-hmm. So my I have the light up alarm that lights up my room. Oh, yeah. And that works wonderfully. We'll link but to I that like, in the show notes because I've heard those talked yeah. about on other podcasts. Oh, my gosh. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I think this is relevant because so many people do use their phones yes. as alarm clocks. And then, of course, the temptation is to look at it. And sometimes you want to look at it at night and then like in the middle of the night if you wake up and then you can't go back to sleep. So um, I have this great it's a Philips and it I think it's called a wake up light or something. Yeah, like that. I've, and I, it slowly lights up my mm-hmm. room and it takes 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So I've traditionally had and I like to get like I like to start actually waking up like when it's about 20 minutes in is when I like to have Mm -hmm. my first alarm Mm -hmm. but you can't really set the alarm to do that like it it does the 30 minutes of lighting up and then the alarm goes off um and because I felt like that would be too jarring I've been setting my phone alarm like 15 minutes earlier than that but then I realized I'm just then I'm working at cross purposes because I'm not letting the alarm do what it's yes. supposed to do which is wake me slowly and naturally. and then you're reaching over for your phone which is like and then i'm reaching different... for my phone yeah. and if i'm really really tired sometimes i'm confused about which alarm is going off and i'm like <laughs> i'm like smacking my clock but it's actually my phone and it's just dumb like i'm really not doing myself any favors so maybe that's a place to start like maybe yeah. just putting my phone on the charger in another room at yep. night is just the 
just the first step. Also, and I know this is not an episode about managing your phone use, but there's so much tied up. Productivity is so related to mood and energy, I think. Yeah. And there's nothing that's more of a mood zapper and an energy sucker than mindless phone scrolling. And it's such a cycle, right? Like when we're already feeling that four o'clock slump, we reach for our phone and then our phone makes us want to just never go anywhere ever again. So it's like, yeah, (laughs) it's, it's a cycle. So I think ignoring the phone is, is a good productivity tip. Just Simply. And one other thing that we've done before, and we did a whole, didn't we do a, like a whole episode about mm-hmm. kind of tricking yourself on some of these things? Yeah. Um, but I have found like, you know how you can scroll through different screens on your phone. Mm-hmm. And I have found that that front loading the front, the first screen with the stuff I really want yes. and need to so be able putting to get the to apps, the day. If you have an iPhone, like putting the apps on the first screen that you, that are, that good. you actually want. <laughs> like for me, it'd be like Voxer. Um, stuff like that. Cause that is, I mean, I never mind Voxing and I yeah. Vox with multiple people. And to me, that's like just a, really great communication tool yeah but that doesn't mean i want to be like um i don't want to be mindlessly sorting through instagram or dating apps oh my gosh i could go off and on and on about those those are like such a time yeah. suck and they're ultimate like mindless yep. scrolling yep. and swiping it's weird but you'll be like well i'm bored well yeah let's, let's see what dudes yeah. are in my area and then i'm like no <laughs> no i don't like any of these but <laughs> it's really but it's very easy you have this little machine and it's got so many possibilities yep. and it's in your hand. So I'm yeah. struggling a little bit, Sarah. We all struggle. I think that's it. important to acknowledge. Yeah. Um, okay. Next tip. All right. Next tip. Um, oh, this one's fun. So train your kids. This mm. is something I think I was just starting to figure out yeah. when I wrote this. Um, and this would have been when I had my fifth baby and kind of cried uncle a little bit yeah. and really started getting my oldest kids on board with and how old were your oldest when clara was born let's see jacob would have been 11 when she was born so when i wrote this she would have been like they would have been like 10 and 12 the oldest two okay um and then oh yeah so then wait would they have been 10 and 12 was something like that yeah and i think by this point they were fully trained to uh be outside waiting for me when i got home with groceries Mm -hmm. so that they could unload the groceries from the car or um unload the dishwasher, load the dishwasher, carry laundry up and down the stairs. I did not go so far as to have them actually do the laundry, mm-hmm. but I would have them carry the heavy stuff up and down, like just stuff like that. And yep. like, it took, it took me most of my pregnancy with Clara really to get mm-hmm. them good and trained, but it was so worth it. Um, because then it like, also it trickles down. Like the younger kids saw that the older kids were contributing in those ways. And they never gave me any flack. Like the mm-hmm. younger two boys have never complained about having household chores and yeah. it didn't take there was no resistance where I feel like there was maybe a little more resistance with the oldest ones because I hadn't yeah expected yeah. it the same way until they got a little older so that's another reason to start early uh yeah I I mean this is just all amen and I I you know I've been listening to you and reading you talk about this stuff for this long eight years yeah. probably and it's an area I always feel like I could be better at but my kids aren't even 10 and 12 yet they're eight they're yeah. 10 and eight um I would say I think what I put to add on this one is so there's the short term. If you train your kids to help with stuff around the house, you will have more time to be productive. So that's like that's kind of the surface level obvious. But I also think it's really, really important for kids to see adults, all adults having a balance of work, play, rest, productivity, creativity, taking care of the house, doing stuff outside the house, being physically active. And so if you start earlier than you think, you're you're also having that added layer of you're training them to do tasks around the house, but you're also training them that it's normal for people to have varying activities throughout the day. And yeah. I what I feel like I'm not great at is I do feel like it's very possible that my three kids look at me as someone who is always rushing around, never sits yeah. down except to look at a computer and work. Do you know what I mean? I'm just not mm-hmm. great about showing that. And so that's, it's okay. That's just something to be better at. But if you, if, yep. if you don't do it just for the purpose of having them have chores and responsibilities, do it for the, the longer term example that you're setting. Um, and I think that's so important. It is important. Yep. Very good point. All right. Well, we're to our final tip. This one's interesting. Um, 
And it's think in five year blocks. And I think this one was written for people like me who want to do all the things Mm -hmm. and who tend to get really, really frustrated or almost panicky Mm -hmm. when we can't see a way clear to do those things right now. So Mm -hmm. if if wherever you're at in life, um, for whatever reason, your kid, the age of your kids or maybe your work schedule or your budget or whatever, don't allow you to do all of those things. It's really easy to just be like, well, I'll never be like, that's just not for me. Or, but what if, What if that's just the next five-year block? Like, what if the five-year block you're in right now is when you're going to focus on these other things? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm not like super legalistic about it. It's not like literally five years, but it's more like a seat, like it's a season in Mm -hmm. five years, your life will be very, very different Mm -hmm. than it is right now. When I wrote this blog post, um, I had a baby and all those things. Five years later, that baby was in school. My Mm -hmm. oldest was like graduating. Like it Mm -hmm. was just a very different time of life. Um, And that'll be the case for me again in five years. I'm going to have, you know, another kid out of the house, one about to go and a teenage daughter. I mean, so everything is like everything from the way I spend my days to like my money situation, everything's going to be different again. And so I'll be, and I'll be different. I'll be older, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you Mm -hmm. know? So, um, I don't know that I guess that was just one of those things for people who feel frustrated by not being able to do the things on their list right now. Yeah, I think that's really, really important. And especially if you are in the trenches, as we say, I I would even say I totally think five years is great. I I have noticed even like 18 months to two years, I think maybe because that's like about the space between (laughs) kids. You know what I mean? Like every couple of years, there's a new challenge, but there's also something that gets hugely easier. And so Um, yes, it's a season. I I think it is a season. And, and also I will say that the reason I think this is a time management tip or Mm -hmm. productivity tip is Mm -hmm. it's impossible to be good at what's in front of you and to do it effectively. If you're thinking about possibilities that just aren't really possible right now, like if you're hung up on something that really isn't going to happen right now, it's going to affect everything else that you're trying to do. It's so. so true. And when we did our seasonal slump episode, that's kind of what I talked about is like, the way that I, the way my slumpiness comes out is actually just avoidance of the season I'm in. And yeah. we talked about more in like, you know, weeks and months, literally seasons, but, but yeah, but it's the same. And that is that there's nothing, it's hard to be motivated and excited and grateful for the things in front of you. If you are mentally, like you said, just kind of w- not wishing it away, but you know what I mean? Like frustrated, yeah. like you said, um, I wanted to add that I was interviewed for a brand new podcast called Both of Us, um, which is largely kind of a marriage and parenting podcast. I My interview was not about marriage. It was about motherhood and parenting. But we talked a lot about how my work and my creative work has changed over the last 10 years. And this kind of reminded me of it because it is um, the host, Marin is definitely in the trenches years. And she asked me questions about, you know, how do you what do you do if you want to do creative work, but you're just not in the right life phase yet? And we talked about that. So you guys should look that up. It's the podcast is called Both of Us. Um, and you, you can just find it wherever you find podcasts. And I did an interview in there. Episode eight. Awesome. All right. Um, so I do have Katie coming on in a minute, but let's do cue it up first, which is where we recommend what you guys should go listen to next. I feel like we've already given you some ideas. We have like there's lots of queued up stuff right now. Yeah, but, we do have yeah. that. To, and all of this, by the way, will be in the show notes at the com. The one the episodes we've already mentioned, as well as the one I'm going to mention in cue it up. Um, but I picked our episode from uh, October of 2016 and it's called A Week of Real Life Dinners. It was episode 72 and I picked it because I really want to do this again this fall, Megan. It would be so fun. Yes, so for sure. what we did is we actually tracked what we made our families for dinner for a week, like the good, the bad, and the ugly including when we didn't feed them dinner and everyone had cereal or whatever and we just went back and forth and what's cool is two of our podcasting uh, cohorts, cohorts, two different podcasts have taken I that like I- cohort. Co- mm. cohorts or cohorts <laughs> Um, have taken that idea and done it on their own podcast. So it kind of started a little trend. So if you like that. that, that was episode 72 of ours. And then in the show notes, I'll link up episodes of the Girl Next Door podcast. They just did this. And then Friendlier podcast did it about a year ago. And both of them, you know, credited us for inspiring the ideas. But it's so fascinating to find out what other people actually serve for dinner. It's one thing to say what's on your meal plan. It's very different to say right. what actually, what, what actually came out. Yes. And so. the fun thing is now you and I both have access to different tools and things that we're using yep. and we're, we, and we have different lifestyles and yep. things have changed again. So that's going to be really fun. Yeah. I would like to, to redo that this fall. Once things are, once, once we're productive Settled. again, yep, exactly. <laughs> out of our seasonal slump. Well, this is really fun guys. Um, hopefully it made you feel 
either ready to be more productive or more okay about not being productive. Wherever you are right now. Both those are good. So stick with me and Katie and I will be up next and Megan and I will talk to you soon. Hey guys, it's Sarah and I am back here with Katie Addis. Hey Katie. Hi Sarah, good to be back. It's I know. It's been a long time. I know, I mentioned in the episode that I hadn't actually seen you or we hadn't recorded in quite a while. Yeah. Um, so Katie, because of that, and we have a lot of new listeners, can you just really quickly remind everybody um, the ages your kids are? Sure. Okay. So Anna Lee is three and a half and she just is constantly looking ahead to when she's four on <laughs> December 17th and she's pretty birthday obsessed. And Luke is coming up on two as of September 1st, he will be two and he's still my big handful. Yeah. Just so you're going to have a two and a three. They're less than two three. years apart. Yes, yeah. they are. Um, so if you guys aren't familiar listening, Katie comes on about once a month and from the very beginning, we've structured this as she brings a success, a struggle and a discovery just from her regular life as a mom of two little ones. Since Megan and I don't have little ones anymore, we have fun kind of reliving this through Katie. So what do you have today? Okay. Well, I have a struggle update. That okay. I will start oh, good. With. So I believe on the last segment, my struggle was about Luke's eczema. Yes. Okay. We and got some listener mail about that too. Yes, I might even we, still need to forward. Some of them I forwarded to you. About. Yes. And based on that, thank you so much yes. listeners for, um, for just chiming in on so many different things. Yeah. I mean, like Sarah was saying, I've been doing struggles now for I don't know, going on 18 months yeah, over and year. listeners have been so overwhelmingly amazing about just offering tips and what worked for them yep. and their kids, particular situations. Way more helpful than I usually am. I'm usually <laughs> like, Oh, that's rough. <laughs> well, no, but it's just been amazing and, yeah. and unique responses too. Yeah. like so many different things. So, um, so his skin update, um, since I last talked about it, I said that I wanted to have him allergy tested mm-hmm. And my pediatrician was resistant to having him tested for whatever reason, but she um, finally agreed and we had him blood tested that day. Results came in um, after we arrived home from vacation and it turned out that he has confirmed sensitivities to milk, Mm -hmm. egg white, peanuts, and cashews. Okay. Um, So, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. So... This is day 10 oh, okay. now, post lab results mm-hmm. and post dairy or living dairy free. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is hard. Yeah. It's hard. And you guys, his eczema, we kind of noticed some improvement maybe around day four, day mm-hmm. five. But then um, just actually yesterday, he, we were at my sister's. He was napping in a foreign place mm-hmm. in his pack and play. He was screaming for 40 minutes, didn't want to nap. I get him up finally, and um, the backs of his knees, Aww. where his exit yeah. normally is, completely raw. Aww. He had just gone to town. Yeah. It was like mutilation. Um, so I had to use the cortisone cream mm-hmm. last night, the two and a half mm-hmm. stuff. After my dad had told me, stop using that stuff because it can actually make them prone to stretch marks. Oh, I did not know Which I did that. not know either. So that freaked me out. Um, what happens is that the steroid thins the skin. Okay. So it just makes it more vulnerable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I put in an email to the pediatrician saying, how long does it take to actually show visible improvement? Mm-hmm. And she said it could take two weeks. Yeah. I mean, I always hear with elimination diets, it's like minimum two weeks and... Okay, yeah. well, I would like to hear even more yeah. time than two weeks because yeah. we're on day 10, so we have four more days, and yeah. his skin right now is absolutely terrible. He's, oh. he's just still itching, um, and we're using the ointment regularly, and he's dairy, egg, peanut, cashew-free. Uh, yeah, that is rough. I know we have listeners out there who have gone through this, so you will probably get more emails. Yeah, I rough. mean, just any mom out there who's – who's either children or if you yourself have dietary restrictions now dealing with them yourself. It's, mm-hmm. it's like any situation when you just look from afar yeah. um, and don't really understand. And then you're immersed into it and realize, wow, this is so hard. Yeah. And all you allergy mamas out there, you guys are amazing. Yeah. Agreed. Because it just eliminates so many, think of all the convenience. Yeah. 
foods that are dairy centered. Yep. Yogurts. String cheese. String yeah. cheese. Um, oh, pizza. Quesadillas. Yeah. yeah. So I understand that there are vegan substitute cheeses out there. But have you ever no tried them, smelled I them? Haven't. My kids are all okay with dairy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cheese is a tough one, I feel like, <laughs> to replicate. So like almond milks tough. and coconut milks and in baking and stuff like that, I feel yes. like that's pretty like pretty easy. Pretty easy the, and, and palatable too. Yeah, definitely. You know, definitely not um repulsive. Yeah. But um my first sniff of that bag of shredded synthetic cheese you know i call i mean synthetic i'm using intentionally because yeah even if it's natural plant-based yeah. it's not cheese it's gnarly it ain't cheese it is the stinkiest cheese <laughs> i is, didn't know it stunk i just know it doesn't um, melt right and doesn't oh, taste it doesn't right it doesn't right. look right <laughs> <laughs> it's just not right period oh i'm sorry That's i rough. know so my struggle has yet to be a yeah. success but i i hope i'm optimistic that a few segments from now. Hopefully that can be my yes, success. Yes, yes, absolutely. We can keep everybody posted. Okay, well, I'll move on to an uplifting discovery. Okay. Okay, it's in the vegan category, okay. and it's not stinky cheese. Okay. It is um, vegan donuts. Oh. That I found at Whole Foods. Really? Yes. So what? What? So egg would be what's not in a... Like, the animal product that would be in a donut would be egg, right? I, I bet. I, yeah. I think so. Um, so I think they, in this particular recipe, they use soy, Uh which I'm trying to be more, um, I'm trying to be soy free with him. For me, soy is a little stigmatized for for various reasons. Um, so I try and do soy free, but I, so I found these vegan donuts. They have soy in them, but they're donuts. So I figured let's let it slide. Um, and I just felt like Luke needed a treat, but really also I felt like I needed a treat mm-hmm. that I could eat in front of him. Yeah, totally. And share with him. Yes, because if you've ever had to ha- tried to have a treat in front of a two-year-old, oh. almost two-year-old, yeah. you'd be hiding in the pantry. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't have a pantry I can fit into. So, um, <laughs> so the thing is that Luke knows the joy yeah. and taste and goodness of all dairy yeah. milk and yeah. all that. Yeah. So anyway, um, not only did he need a treat, I need a treat, but I had a breakfast planned at a bakery um, yesterday. And so what I did was I took my container of donuts in the, you know, plastic packaging. And when my um, cinnamon roll came up on the on the counter at the restaurant, um, I asked for another little, you know, dish or whatever yeah. and just stuck his donuts on that same exact looking plate with the same paper and it all looked the same. And then just did a little, you know, little switcheroo from the Whole Foods packaging. Just like people do at Thanksgiving dinner, you know? I love it. And um, he was none the wiser. And Anna Lee and he just gobbled up those donuts while I enjoyed my cinnamon roll. That's awesome. And it was great. Okay, so vegan donuts from Whole Foods. Yeah. Good find. And then my success. Okay, this is... A very heartwarming thing that just happened today. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so I was at Trader Joe's, and I was picking up just a few things. I wasn't doing my normal grocery haul, and I get to the checkout line, and I know the checker, and um, she totals up my my groceries, and uh, I look in my purse, and my wallet's not there. Oh, no. And this is not the first time this has happened. Um I have gone into so many different places without my wallet, without my purse, with my purse, without my wallet in it. I mean, do you ever do scatter brain stuff like that, Sarah? I that is not a That's particular not issue of mine, <laughs> but I have others. It's all okay. good. Okay. Um, so I, I remembered that I had taken my wallet from my purse late last night because I needed to renew some overdue library books. Yes. Um, and I had never replaced my wallet in my purse. So the cashier and I are going back and forth about like, well, we'll suspend the order, go check your car, da 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 da. We'll put the food in the fridge. Um, so I step outside, remember the whole wallet out of the mm-hmm. purse thing, go back inside, say, I'll run back to my house. Let me be back in ten minutes. The sweet girl um, behind me, she was probably late twenties, early thirties, was like, no, 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 no. That is silly. Do not go home. Let me pay for your groceries. Oh, my gosh. She's like, I got this. Um, and I was 
totally refusing. No, oh my gosh, no. It looks like I have more stuff than you. Um, let me go through and, and pare down. Yeah. And, and she was just, she was so insistent. She's like, no, this is my good deed of the day. I said, I think this is your good deed of the year. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, it was $22. So I, I was so mortified, embarrassed, humbled, all of the yeah, emotions. Everything. Yeah. There was lots of commotion. I didn't even think to get her address yeah. or phone number. Yeah. Um, the first thing Kyle asked me when I got home was, well, did you get her phone number? Yeah. Um, and I said, you know, I, I didn't think of it till I got in the car. And then I did circle the parking lot right. looking for her. Couldn't find her. Um, but she said she and the cashier were like, just pay it forward. And I certainly will. Yeah, that's awesome. I know. I mean, in the midst of terrible fires happening down yeah. where Sarah and I live, some of which were started intentionally. Yeah. It just makes you lose faith in humanity, yeah. but then stories like this restore it. I love it. I, I love know, it. I know. That's awesome. Um, okay. Well, Katie, it's so good to have you back on the show. And um, I also wanted to mention that on the blog at the momhour.com, Katie usually does one blog post around the same time that this segment airs. So mm -hmm. you can head to the show notes for this episode, which is 169, and I'll link it up. Or just click the little blog tab at the top of the page and read some of Katie's writing. So. And this one will be favorite vegan finds. Right. I just decided. And so I would love, love, love all of your favorite vegan finds. Yeah, so head there and comment um, and, and check out Katie's finds too. That's a great idea. All right. We'll be back with Katie in about a month. Okay. Thanks, bye Katie. guys.